Welcome back. We are doing our leadership conversations here with Pastor Kong Hee from City Harvest Church, Singapore. I know you've been so blessed. Uh, every time I talk to Pastor, I love Jesus more and love people more. And we've been learning about how we need to love God with all of our heart, love our neighbor as ourselves. Everything we do is about love and, and kind of journeying through the City Harvest Church story. I've been a part of it, uh, you know, but um, as we grew as a church, I think we've always been strong and really had a heart for a generation. We learned that, you know, God's the God of Abraham, Isaac, <laughs> yes. and Jacob. So uh, everyone's probably listening and thinking, you know, find a hurt healer. I just, every, you know, when you learn something, it's like, as Pastor Kong used to say, and as, as someone I knew say, and now as I say, you know, so I, I you know, a lot of the things, we make it a part of what we're, we're saying too, but it, it's about uh, reaching the next generation and, and seeing God be a transgenerational God. A lot right. of churches are growing old yeah. um, and, and, and we're losing the next generation. I know this is something's always been passionate and God's you know always used you to keep that fire going. Even right now, again, um, God's giving strategy downloads to engage the young people again. So can you share a bit about how we kind of grew and uh, we, we developed a, a, a very powerful uh, model called Emerge that went all over Asia and brought revival to many of the nations there. And, and just kind of take us in that journey and how that developed and how God led you. Yeah, by 2012, our church was about 10 to 12,000 people. And uh, the first generation grew up together with me and we were in our 30s and 40s. And suddenly one day I realized that the number of young people, when I talk about youth, I mean between 13 to 19, and uh, young adults at that point in time, we define it as 20 to 25. So mm -hmm. between 13 to 25, it's getting lesser and lesser and yeah. lesser. So I was a little concerned. And then one day I, I was in prayer and I felt the Lord really spoke to me that He's a transgenerational God. You just say that He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. That the city harvest revival may potentially end in just one generation, mm, mm. if I don't do something to reach out to the youth. Yeah. And then I realized one thing, the Holy Spirit asked me, he said, how old were you when you got saved? Mm. <laughs> I was 11 years old. <laughs> and I realized that possibly 75% or 90% of people in Singapore got saved under the age of 19. Wow. So if you're going to get saved mm. as a believer in my city, mm most likely you will get saved when you were a youth. Mm. So that got me excited. I said, I got to do something. I got to do something. And then I came across an article on um, why was MTV so popular? You know, <laughs> all the young people in those days, yep. you know, they were watching MTV, music television. And then, I, and then some sociologists say, because MTV, give youth the idea that whatever they can dream of, they can achieve it. Mm. It, it opens up their mind mm. that they can do something greater. They can be creative. Mm. That's why it's, they're so popular. Mm. So I said that, you know, I got to give the young people to be touched by the Lord and give them a big dream, mm. a big vision mm. that God wants them to be creative, to be bold, to be innovative, and uh, so we started a youth conference. And Sun at that point said, why don't we call it Emerge? <laughs> and little did we know that Emerge became like a branding. Yeah. They went throughout Asia. And in fact, uh, many youth ministries around the world, they call their youth, uh, or they call their ministries Emerge. Yeah. And, and the, the beautiful thing here is this. Not only are young people most open to the gospel, mm. They make the best disciples. Yeah. yeah. Jesus had the young people. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus was 30 years old when he got started. And practically the 12, they're all under 30. Yeah. The youngest probably was John, mm. probably between 16 to 19. Mm -hmm. And uh, young people, they're very impressionable. Mm. That is why in secret boxes, you have all the Surgeon General warnings. Yeah. They're impressionable because their hearts are very open. Mm. So they they have they believe anything mm. that tells me one thing yeah. they have the capacity for faith wow they can if you give them a reason to believe mm. they will believe all the mm. way so i was thinking they're most open to the gospel they have a capacity for faith they make the best disciple so i said guys let's focus on the youth mm. and boy i didn't know that that by obeying god in that area 
we were answering a call from the Lord for uh, youth ministries in Singapore and throughout yeah. Asia. Yeah. And over the next eight years, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say half a million to one million yeah. young people yeah. all throughout Asia gave their hearts to Jesus. Yeah. That's our journey. Yeah, I, you know, I, I remember being part, I was more in the adult ministry uh, at the time, but I would come and, you know, be a part of the Emerge Conference and come and see, and, you know, young people who were so shy in the beginning up there. And, you know, we did things like fashion, we had singing, you know, all, all the uh, the groups and the cheerleading and all of that stuff going on and, and such fun, such joy. Yeah. And many of them were unchurched people. Unchurched people. And, you know, we, we got 13, 14 year, year olds to go up to the stage and lead in prayer. <laughs> and I mean, everybody, everybody knew they were just youth. Yeah. You know, they're not gonna pray like a spiritual giant. Yeah. But the fact that they see a youth on the stage praying, yeah. all the young people said, we can do that. Yeah. We too can pray. Yeah. So every time we have, we have uh, young people doing fasting, I would showcase that. Yeah. And, and, the, and the rest of the young people say, we can fast too. Yeah. And I got them to memorize scriptures, remember? Yeah. We have something called the word power. So yes. basically, <laughs> we just ask them to memorize and they got to memorize the 50 scriptures. And in, the punctuation. In the year. And they got, to, they got to remember every part, every jot and titter, like Jesus says. Yeah. And uh, they memorize it and they grew and they grew. Yeah. And the beautiful thing is that when they are set on fire, mm. they will invite their friends. Yeah. And, and uh, we were in practically every campus in Singapore. Yeah. With the exception of a few, we have about I don't know, hundreds of high schools. Yeah. And we have a Bible study group, a cell group in practically every single school. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so the Church Without Walls, that kind of developed in reaching youth too, yeah. not just meeting needs. Um, you know, and so many times the concept is like, invite people to church, invite people to church. But we kind of flipped it and went, you know, into that place and then- We bring church to them. Bring church to them. And even though they're not saved. <laughs> even though they're not saved, we bring church to them and we just show them the love of Jesus. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to, when you bring church to the unchurched, to the unsaved, you're not going to tell them, uh, turn with me to the, <laughs> to the book of Deuteronomy. They don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So we show through practical act of, of service. And you know, I, I, I love the Jesus principle of Luke chapter 10. Mm. Jesus says that when you come into a town, first thing you do, you befriend. Yeah. Number two, you fellowship. Yeah. Number three, you meet a practical need. Yeah. And then number four, you share the gospel with them. Mm. So we don't go in and, you know, try to bring the gospel to them immediately. We try to befriend them, yeah. get to know them, invite them to our homes or go and visit them in their homes and try to be sensitive. What are their needs? So if you're reaching out to a youth, maybe he or she is failing in the studies. Mm. So we provide free tuition. Yeah. Maybe the person is uh, in an abusive background. We try to mediate. If we can't, we try to provide a shelter. If we can't, we just be a listening ear, mm. a shoulder to lean on. Just by befriending them, meeting their needs, you find that their hearts begin to open. And when you share the love of Jesus, it makes absolute sense. Yeah. Of course, Jesus loves me because I experienced that love from you. Mm. Will you receive Jesus? Of course. Yeah. If Jesus has changed your life, I want him to change my yeah. life. We saw thousands yeah. upon thousands come into the kingdom. Yeah. Not because we are hard selling the gospel, but we are showing the reality of the love of God. Yeah. And we call that the friendship evangelism. And we right. develop well, the caring system. Yeah, caring system. It is, is caring for them first. And, you know, I, I think it's so important. We've tried to emulate that. And I do that first when we went into the college campuses and just engaging people, meet their needs, they're away from their families. And, yeah. and it works anywhere. It works in yeah. America. It works. Everybody has needs. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> no matter how successful you may seem or to be or how rich you are, how poor everyone has needs. Mm. Our job is to introduce to them yeah. a God who loves to meet their needs. Yeah. A God who loves them. Yeah. I want to save them. Yeah. And then their hearts are open. Yeah. And it's easy to cast yeah. the net and get the harvest in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so beautiful. You know, some, like I just, you mentioned in the last session, it's the simplicity of the gospel. Yeah. You know, we complicate things, but we just do the Jesus way, follow what Jesus did, we're gonna have the same results. I My, my thinking is this, you know, we, we've been doing church for so many years and uh, we, 
we want everything to be done in excellence. Mm. We want everything to be done well because our God is an excellent God and yeah. we do have to have a spirit of excellence. But we also got to watch that we do not become too performance oriented. Mm. Yeah. Where doing church is all about performance. Yeah. We want to compete with the best professionals in the world. Yeah. And then things get very complicated. Yeah. Know? Yeah, we can get too professional. <laughs> yeah, we can get yeah. too professional. Yeah. Let's keep the gospel simple. Mm. Let's keep showing the love of Jesus. Love it. And Pastor, you mentioned about getting the youth up, you know, and I think, uh, you know, sometimes in getting professional, we have a certain way of doing it. We have people who have been doing something for years and the standard is so high. Yeah. How do we involve the youth in, in getting them up? You know, I love the. you said something before and I never forgot it. Whatever you want to uh, showcase and celebrate, you do it on stage so that it will get into the people. Yeah. So how do we give the next generation the standard? I mean, now we've got people who can preach so well, prophesy, lead, and you know, so well, but I can see you're bringing in the next generation also. Right. So we need to educate our people and then help people to step onto that platform because now it's thousands, it's not hundreds like it used to be. Yeah. The, the learning curve can be very high. How, how do you, what advice would you give in to do that? I think you obviously got to prepare them. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you, you got to train them. So that's an opportunity for them to receive training too. Mm. And then you keep encouraging mm. them. And you build a accepting environment. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the congregation, they appreciate that. They, yeah. they, they look at a scruffy looking teenager. Yeah. They're not going to expect the person to speak like an eloquent orator. Yeah. He's just a teenager. Yeah. And I, I can, I can, I can, probably guarantee that many parents seeing a 14 year old on the stage praying would secretly wish, ah, oh, I so wish that my kid <laughs> yeah. will also be that spiritual. <laughs> yeah. So they'll be celebrating. Yeah. Yeah. And what it does for the entire church is, is just amazing. It will just, you know, encourage everybody to celebrate and to go for whatever you're putting on the stage. If you want to reach out to young people, you got to put young people there. Yeah. If you want to reach out to professionals, you got to put professionals there. Whoever you want, people rise to what they see. Yeah. So I'm very uh, intentional. Like whatever I want to motivate and encourage, I let the people see it. Mm, mm. <laughs> and I love the part, you always get people to share their testimonies. Maybe what's the strategy? I know it's heartfelt, but <laughs> because all generations are testifying, what's the power in the testimony? I mean, Revelation 12, yeah. verse 10, right? Yeah. You will overcome the devil by the word of the testimony. Yeah. Testimony is powerful. Yeah. And uh, you make it real. Yeah. So that people know that whatever you're sharing is not just the radical, yeah. but it's real. Yeah. It's changing lives. Yeah. And the, the message I want to give to the members when they hear testimony is, if God can do that for this person, yeah. he can do that for you. Yeah. I love it. The beauty, and you know, I love the emerge testimonies when you hear the young people. We have old people testifying, business people testifying, people from all different walks of life, and it builds faith in the people, you know, to believe God. And I love the diversity. You know, one thing I love about City Harvest Church, you know, we have very contemporary, I don't like that word, but, you know, modern music, but we still did orchestra. <laughs> we still had Chinese, you know, Mandarin song, and, but showcasing people's diversity yeah. and, and being able to love God. And that's yeah. the beauty of the kingdom. Yeah. I yeah. think every church has to find its distinctive. Yeah. And for me here in Asia, in the Far East, mm. we are first and foremost Asians. Yeah. I think it would be extremely unnatural for us to try to emulate the West. Yeah. Uh, we are not a European church. We're not an American church. So we got to be true to ourselves. And yeah. the beautiful thing is that the Holy Spirit works through every culture. Yeah. He's poured out on all flesh. Yeah. And that means Jewish flesh, Gentile flesh, European flesh, white flesh, black flesh, yellow flesh, yeah. brown flesh. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, he's poured on all. Yeah. And he can use every culture to to extend the work of the kingdom. That's yeah. the beautiful thing. Yeah. <laughs> And that's the distinctive. That's why we have different churches because God gives us that distinctive in our diversity, yes. in our cities, in yes. our culture, yes. and we can celebrate each other. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm so proud of City Harvest Church in Orange County. And I know that uh, you are my disciple, but I don't want you just to mimic me yeah. or to mimic us. Yeah. And you're a man of God. And as you seek the Lord, God has a distinct blueprint for CHCOC. Yeah. 
and you're going to do something so great that it's going to impact your generation in your neck of the woods. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> well, there you have it. Such wonderful things to come on. We need to keep engaging uh, the next generation. Showcase. Don't be ashamed of the next generation. Give them an opportunity. Uh, find out their needs. Meet them. Let their creativity come out. There's many different ways to do it, but find your distinctive as you seek the Lord. It sounds uh, complicated, but it's so simple. We just need to get the, the, the uh, blueprint of God and heaven and our territory. Come and engage the people God give us with our distinctive. Thank you so much, Pastor Kong. We'll see you guys in the next episode.